Hello everyone, my name is Steven Zapata. I'm a concept artist, illustrator, online art teacher, and former instructor at Art Center College of Design. I would like to introduce you to my new drawing course, Form from Imagination, a course designed to help you draw with confidence from your mind. Maybe you want to be a professional illustrator or designer. Maybe you want to be a master with a pencil. Or maybe you just want to be the best artist that you can be. Beautiful goals, but it's not always clear how to improve the work that you do from imagination. Over the past six months, I've taken all of the little eurekas, tips, and essential exercises that gave me confidence drawing from my mind and compiled them into a sequential course. We start with the absolute foundations, covering the scientific nature of light and shadow, how to hatch, how to create flat tones, how to render spheres and cubes. And step by step, we move through combined shapes, complex shapes, organic shapes. We cover how to simplify extremely complex subjects like the head into basic shapes so that you can handle them more easily from your head. We look at how to understand and treat details. And by the end of these 14 chapters with over 50 video lessons, you'll be ready to do complex designs from your mind with fidelity and energy. And all the demos are done in pencil on paper, so you can do all of the assignments even if you don't have a fancy digital art setup. But I also have demos, instructions, and modifications to the assignments for those who do want to do them digitally. Here's how it works. Go to formfromimagination.com and sign up for the course. Download the assignment book and start watching the lectures. Do the assignments at your own pace. Take your time with them and use this self-study to develop your patience. When you're done, post your assignments in the exclusive community hub and I'll personally critique your work with drawovers, diagrams, and advice. I want you to know this course is no joke just because it's online. It is challenging content and it is more complete than it would be if I was teaching this class at an art college as I have before. If I was teaching this class in person at Art Center today, I would just play these videos in class, knowing full well that they're the most concise, focused, edited, step-by-step -step way to convey the material. So I'm serious when I say, this course isn't just a substitute for a college level course, it's better than a college level course. And you don't have to pay thousands of dollars per credit and wind up hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. So thank you for checking out the course. Thank you for watching this and for your support. And thank you for drawing and making your artwork. The world needs it. I'll see you soon. The year is 87.039, new nonlinear time. It's been 50,000 years since Steven Zapata's final art stream but we still live in a golden age defined by the gifts his stream bestowed upon mankind. Faster than light travel, eternal life, Stephen cloning, and the keys to a truly galactic human civilization. My name is Stave Satipaz, a reminder clone of Stephen Zapata, an exact reproduction of his personality as constructed by an AI compiling millions of hours of his original art streams. By all accounts, I'm exactly like the original Stephen's public persona, just more muscular, exactly as he would have wanted. I travel the stars on my light tracer, a dream of Steven. My crew is, of course, all clones of Steven. Some of my officers are reminders like me, but not all. Some are bio clones, and yet others are aspectoids, clones who, instead of trying to capture his full essence, amplify a particular portion of the original Steven's personality. We've spent hundreds of years drawing, exploring, and philosophizing while snaking our way through the stars, spreading the good word of design. But we've had another secret mission as we've cruised the cosmos. We, I, seek information on the legendary originals, Stephen Zapata's true drawings that he flung wide across the stars at the end of his life on Earth, never to be seen again. My crew thinks I'm looking for them for the same reason all the other madmen do because they would be valuable beyond all reason. But they don't know what I know, that a critical mass of originals in the hands of a trained reminder can provide a psychic link to the original Stephen mind. Once I collect enough, I'll be able to fulfill my destiny and achieve psychological continuity with the original Stephen. And through me, he will live again to usher in golden ages of art forever. Drawing Ascendant, The Eternal Chronicles of Stephen Zapata.
Lasting Legacy 1, Epic 1. People, friends, human beings, possibly animals for whom my voice is left on in the background as a comfort in, on long, lonely days without their owners, while their owners are out at work. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the stream, to all of you. Um, it's Monday, November 21st. The holidays are upon us. It's a dark and often cold time that requires commerce, seeing family members, arguing with them, and uh, most importantly, uh, for many people, the consumption of far too much alcohol. So I know that we all have challenges ahead of us as the holiday season looms. Um, I'm here to help. I'm here to help. I'm here to provide whatever small comfort I can, as well as uh, premium drawing courses on sale over on www.formfromimagination.com. Form from Imagination is $100 off for the next week. You get it, you got it, you get the course, you got the course, and once you got the course, you get the course, of course. So go on and get the course, because uh, that's the course, of course. Hi, everybody, how's it going? Hello, Ben Hillman, Ignis Puikis, Saman Kucher, the precious Nick Ravioli, Stephen Gobert, Oster, reaching for the divine, my dear friend, Matt, DSFF, Cade, Ayub Azakmam, Sabina Hannes, Rappi, and I believe that's, nope, I missed Keho Art and Aldrin Miles Bartosa. Happy Monday, everybody. We're working on the Gabalinos. Uh, this is the same lineup we had on the last stream. We're gonna keep poking at the guys that we are rendering left to right. I also did this sketch of a Gobelino in my sketchbook this morning. I thought I'd maybe add something like that to the lineup, uh, sort of a contrast to the muscle. The muscle looks intelligent, sophisticated, like a, a nightclub bouncer kind of an energy, I would say. This guy is uh, certainly uh, has some muscle on him, but more on the monstrous side. So I thought that he kind of pulled the archetypal triangle out to another point. So I think I'm going to add him. All right, everybody. Let's see, let me get some music going for y'all. So that's from a cell phone shot from my sketchbook. That's what he looks like on the page. I'm just going to quickly redraw over this. Digitale. Von Digital. And then we will use that as the base for adding this gentleman. I cry, says Dino Blaster, don't we all? We all cry. Sometimes you gotta cry. Even though it's a Monday morning, and drawing has begun afresh. Gonna try to not rush. Never wanna rush when you're putting down the initial drawing for something. Hard not to though, even when you know it's important. Especially for a form-loving sucker like me. I'm like, drawing's great, but I want to render it. And, uh, well, history is full of the legendary downfalls of artists like me. I saw Nope 
by Jordan Peele last night. Watched it with my wife. I really liked it. I gotta tell you, I really like Nope. I love me a good um, UFO movie. It was a new angle on it, unique feel. It was nice to see one of my favorite and most well-trodden genres handled a little differently. You know what we're talking about is gobbelino. Sweet, sweet gobbelino. <sighs> yes, you joined the goblin family, I did. I'm fully integrated into goblin society, baby. I've got a vote at the goblin potlatch. I don't know what a potlatch is. at the goblin sitting circle around the fire at night, they give me the speaking stick, which is covered in gross and disgusting sick and human entrails. But I'll take that speaking stick and I do my grunts and my vocalizations and the other goblins and the family go mm, mm, to imply that I am both wise and brave, learned and generous. It's me and my precious gobbly gnomes. Me and my goblin family running through the woods, holding each other's hands and telling each other stories. Me and my goblin family. Me and my goblin. Me and my goblin family. I always want a good layout for the head. I generally don't need to do as tight a layout for the body because uh, at least the way I like to do them for concepts like these, the bodies really wind up being um, mostly a statement of values, of value structures. So if I get too crazy doing intricate line work for this sort of a color render thing, it all just winds up being wasted anyway. I always wind up un destroying the lines completely so that I can just get value shapes. So generally won't go as far with that. Fish flops with the 10 SGD buy me coffee and other things. Thank you so much. Fish flops. You're beautiful. You're incredible. You're amazing. I love it. Can't wait to transmute it into glorious coffee. Or one of the other many strange options that are available to me in my locale. There's a, they got some new drink at my coffee shop. It's like a, what do they call it? A chaga mate or something like that. I, I, it all sounds fake to me. I don't think it's real but it's like uh, some coffee substitute that's made out of ground up mushrooms. It's like, yeah, it sounds like, sounds like some crap I'd eat. I'm gonna be honest. 
sounds like some crap I'd eat. And maybe it's Fish Flops who's going to have made it possible for me to drink ground up mushroom juice. Ground up mushroom juice, it's good for your health. Step right up, step right up, get our ground up mushroom juice. Fish Flops, giving me the ground up mushroom juice. A set of fish flops giving me the ground up, 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 mushroom juice, yeah. I don't think fish flops like that one. Fish flops has discerning taste. Fish flops doesn't like it when the song is um, a little too freewheeling. Harmonies are off. Doesn't really feel like I put that much effort into it. Fish Flops always sends me a note afterwards if I phoned it in on the song. They're usually very, uh, they're very damaging. Sometimes they're just a note that says like, a, you could, you're better than that. It's like, I don't like that, that hurts. He has the pencil stick of destiny. What's the music, Zapata? Um, it is, if anybody wants it, this is the Epidemic Sound Retro Wave Essentials playlist. I've played this one many times on stream. I put a link in there. Colin says, oh, Colin. I don't know why I went to Colin. <laughs> like, why would I read Colin? As colon, like, like, what am I thinking about? <laughs> like, what's on my mind? <laughs> that would make me say that. What could it be? Colin says, have you always been this comfortable in front of a camera? Um, well, not always, but I, I started getting comfortable with it uh, rather early, so. But I'm sure before I had tried it a few times um, that I was as nervous as anybody else. I'm also not always comfortable. I, I get nervous sometimes. It's just, I don't really care if I'm nervous, if that makes sense. Like I've done stuff like this enough that I've realized and integrated that people can't really tell you're nervous unless you kind of give the game away. So it's all right, it's not a big deal. It's like, you know people who when they go up for public speaking, the first thing they do is they tell everyone like, whoa, I'm really nervous. I would never do that. I would lie. I'd say, I feel perfectly calm. And they'd never be able to tell the difference. Multiple nibbles. Multiple nibbles on this big goblin. Multiple nipples is what I was trying to say. Daraman says, oh my God, I just found your channel randomly. Looks like I'm gonna be binge watching your last, li your last live stream, past live streams. Go binge watch, check them out. I mean, there is so much useful singing in there.
And that's what everyone's here for, right? Good morning, Jody Mars. How you doing, Joe? Tam B says, good morning. Bought the course when it went on sale last night. Very excited to start. Tam B, thank you so much. That's beautiful. I appreciate the support and I wish you the best of luck on your learning journey. And I can't wait to see your assignments. That's fantastic. I am moved to emotion. I am a human being, a real one. Humans have emotions, so I have them. Thank you so much for your purchase. Thank you, Tam B. Enjoy the course. Really pay attention to those first units. Nature of light. Very, very important. It's like in some sense, it's all in there. Theoretically, if you just listen to the Nature of Light uh, multimedia documentaries there at the beginning, you could theoretically extrapolate everything else. Nature of Light and the modeling factors, those two modules together. If you, if you took the time to really just let it expand out, you wouldn't need to hear anything else. That's all in there. I love what you said about time balance. Oh yeah. You gotta manage your time. It's very, very important. And you must prioritize your creativity. I actually think I had those arms uglier in the sketch. Maybe I'll mess up his elbow with some calcified growths. Some nasty ostification on these bonus protrusions, bony protrusions, but they're also bonus protrusions. Nick Ravioli says, technical question, any good basic advice for line weight? Um, the two usual 
tricks apply. I mean, me, me when I'm sketching stuff like this, I sort of do line weight naturally, you know, just from lots and lots of practice. I don't, I don't hunt for like um, perfect line weight or like really stick into the rules because I'm gonna paint all of this stuff out and I usually do put values over most of the stuff that I do. But the two main points are one, say you do a sphere, right? Let's say this is supposed to be a sphere. That's the cast shadow. The fact that the line weight thins right here and is thicker on the back automatically implies the lighting situation, even without any value. So if the light bulb was up here, this makes this top right portion of the circle feel closer to the light source and this implies shadow. Whereas if you did it the opposite way, something feels very off there. Something feels very wrong. Um, the other tip is to, when you take corners, let's say I was inking this elbow right here. It would feel a little weird if when I took the corner of this elbow, it got thicker at the corner and then went thinner as it went out to the muscle bellies. It tends to look more natural. It tends to look a little better if it's thicker at the bellies and it gets thinner as it hits the elbow. The reason for that is that implies tension. You know, you can imagine if this was like a, a fabric that you had sitting over a ball, it would get thinner there and there would be more fabric down here where you're sort of pulling. Um, and it makes it feel a little bit more like bone. A lot of the corners occur at joints where there's bone. And uh, if we get really metaphysical, if we take the way that lines transition to be almost like a, a car taking a corner, when there's more value down in an area, it feels like the car is going slower. And when there's less value down in an area, it makes it feel like the car is going quicker. So it accelerates in the corners and goes slower at the muscle bellies. Those are the two main line work tips that you get from like anchors and stuff like that. Um, there's always a good reason to violate those rules. They're not, they're not something that needs to be stuck to slavishly. And the most important thing to remember is that any individual drawing that you are doing just needs to be a beautiful abstract arrangement of various line weights in order for the line weights to succeed. So if you find a way to make the abstract arrangement of lines beautiful, even if it violates every imaginable line weight rule, it'll still be beautiful and screw everybody. My lines are race cars. Feels good, man. Yeah. I mean, when you're inking some uh, some tense stuff, it uh, it definitely feels that way. When the stakes are actually there, you're inking something that you spent a long time designing, and you've got one shot. You know, if you're doing it traditional, uh, it definitely feels like you're trying to manage a. Uh, a very fast race car that is threatening to lose control at any moment around some tricky curves. It can absolutely feel like that. And just like in a race car, it can feel like your life is on the line.
No, I don't like that leg. So it matches the arms a little better. Good morning, Chris Maycock. I'm drawing a gray alien right now, your greatest childhood fear, Steven. Yeah, thanks for telling me. Cool. Real cool. Draw it tucking Steven into bed and kissing his forehead goodnight. Do not do that. Do not. I repeat. I repeat. Do not draw gray aliens tucking me into bed and kissing me on the forehead goodnight. This is an official announcement from the Steven Advisory System. A reminder to all stream residents that it is illegal and uncouth to draw pictures of gray aliens tucking Steven into bed while kissing him on his little forehead. Your compliance with this directive is considered compulsory. No more music, it's on. It's just very quiet.
Kind of make his toes a little more monstrous. They were looking a little bit too much like sexy. I mean, normal feet, shit, what did I say? Like normal feet, like normal uninteresting feet. For our little... Does that work for our little gobelino? Yeah, I think I got it all. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, boss. <laughs> Pencil drawing eight. He is Gobelino number eight. Mm. You reckon I could parry that bad boy? You gotta ask the International Parry Association of America, not me. Only they know what can and cannot be parried. You know what? I got a I got some love for this guy, so maybe I'll just uh, work on him a little bit, and then we'll go over to the blue guy. Keep working on him. But I got momentum for this guy right now. Momentum for this guy at 1018 on Monday, November 21st. As you guys know, I always say the time and date on the stream as often as possible in case I'm ever implicated in a crime and I need an alibi. Do you have neighbors who have barking dogs? I mean, very loud barking dogs. Um, not really. Uh, my co-op, uh, the area, the co-op that I live in is a uh, pretty slow to approve dog. So there's only like four dogs in the whole building, mine included. My dog barks two times a day in the morning to get her breakfast, and then at night when my wife comes home. Yes, sometimes on stream, at lunch, to get her lunchtime cookie as well. Who trained who? That's the question. She's not here. 
We left her at my in-laws yesterday. We're not going to see her until Wednesday when we go back there for Thanksgiving. It's very sad. I mean, the home has such a different energy when she's not here. And I hate being without her, but she needed some time with her sister to run and play in the backyard. Unfortunately, that is not the case here. They are outside and bark at everything that moves. You just got to take it upon yourself to uh, train them. You got to go out there with some New York strip steak, cut it up into little bits, befriend them and train them to be quiet. It's the only way. It's not their own. It's not the owner's responsibility. The owner's clearly not bothered by the barking. You're the one who's bothered, so it's your responsibility to train them. Hey Steven, have you ever tried Krita? If so, what do you think about it? I have not personally tried Krita. Looks good. I know a bunch of people who use it. But I have never tried it. But people make cool paintings in there. It looks like it's fully featured. Steven, what if they make a telenovela in slow motion? Oh my god, telenovelas already feel like they go in slow motion. I don't think anyone should make that. It's my personal opinion. It would be a total drag. What a slog. Oh my god. Communicados from the wife. Tell wife we said hiya. I'm not sure that would be appropriate. The tone of our conversation right now is the relaying of important of important apartment hunt info. <laughs> I don't think I. Not the time to insert greetings. These are cold reptilian calculations that are happening in this conversation right now. <laughs> It's all numbers and projections.
Good luck on adulting, thank you. We all need luck, adulting, for sure. No, no, bad Photoshop. Down Photoshop, down. Drop it. Photoshop. pass on this guy right here. Now the question is, how um, rigorous do I want to be with this value pass? My guts say no, not that rigorous. Have you tried doing 2D in Blender with the new grease pencil? I have not. I've seen a lot of cool stuff with grease pencil, but um, I have not tried it. You know, I feel like I have the tools that I want for straight 2D. I, I, would, I would use grease pencil if I wanted like a 2D effect in a 3D comp or something like that. But um, if I'm gonna go into Blender, it's a, uh, If I'm gonna go into Blender, it is for the express purposes of making truly 3D things. Steven, can you draw a simplified bat real quick? I'm having a hard time. Boom, baby. Completely original too. I mean, that's a simplification no one has ever seen anywhere else. I nailed it, I nailed it. Damn it, Karem, now I don't have my, now I don't know what value I was using for the, for my multiply layer. Oh, you really screwed me on this one, bud.
All right, Jesus, I'm just. I'm doing it. I'm actually putting the teeth on their own layer. For the first time in recorded Steven history, I'm actually doing it. God knows what got into me today. Nice and sharp. You can all stop judging me now. Steven, you got any tips on drawing drapery? Buy expensive clothes. That's the best tip I can give you. You should be buying the most expensive clothes that you can afford. Actually, what you can afford, you go two steps up. So if you can only afford Fendi, you go a little extra, you get the Gucci Couture. You want the best clothes possible because you need real world references for drapery. It's impossible to invent effectively. And poor clothing, like poorly made clothing, also clothes for poor people because it's cheap, it doesn't gather right. It doesn't bunch well. The darts are all over the place. The seams are sloppy. Everything is ill-fitting. If you practice on poor people clothes, you're gonna make shitty drawings for the rest of your life. So. The way that I was trained was that I bought only the most haut couture, most expensive, most high fashion clothing possible, put it on my friends, on myself, on my wife, on my dog, draped it on mannequins, and I practiced from that. And that is the only way to unlock an intuitive understanding of how clothing is actually supposed to fit in a high level scenario. It's all points of tension. You just wanna study the points of tension. If you understand the points of tension on a piece of drapery, then the way that the, fab the rest of the neutral fabric falls just based on gravity is pretty intuitive. Also, I will say, um, I would not get hung up too long on uh, hoping that you can understand clothing to the level that you sort of like have marvelous designer in your head. That's a 3D software that uh, models clothing with physics so that it's as accurate as possible for 3D models. Um, you don't want to like aim for that and I actually think that drapery, like the mechanics of drapery, is a little bit of a red herring. And that that's not actually the understanding most people want for the clothing they're going to draw. Um, I personally, and this could totally be personal opinion, I think that you should spend more time investigating the nature of costume design, like historical costume, the way that clothing is put together, rather than um, obsessing about making these half-ass calculations about oh, this many folds will radiate from this tension point and it'll bunch up like this with half locks and full locks and things like that. I think that the basics can be got there in maybe a couple weeks of study. And then after that, most of what you really want about drawing drapery is actually understanding how clothing is arranged in a historical and cultural 
context. And if you understand that stuff, like how clothing has oscillated between having loose silhouettes and tight silhouettes, you know, being uh, loosely gathered or being cut trim, you know, clothing being cut on the bias or being cut perpendicular. It's like those things are, um, I think, give you more bang for your study buck than worrying too much about the mechanics of drapery. I think about the people who actually make clothing, um, fashion designers and stuff like that. I mean, they, they barely, you know, they don't understand the mechanics of folds in drawing super well. They understand how to actually construct clothing and what the construction methods mean for clothing. Any books you got of costume design from historic context? It's actually such a vast field of study that it couldn't fit into one book. You can get an overview from um, like, a, you know, eyewitness books, you know, a classic uh, sort of infographic encyclopedic book line. You can get their historical fashions book, um, things like that. But it's such a big subject, it, it'll never fit into one book. And uh, I actually think the way to think about it is to just make a hobby of learning about those things a little bit. There's lots of great YouTube channels that cover that stuff. And it's also to be investigated um, project to project. You know, you don't need to have it all sitting in your head like you're a clothing encyclopedia, like I said. You can, um, you just need to have the understanding that when you do a project that is based on medieval times or the American 1920s or something like that, that you should go research. Uh, how did pattern making change around that time? What were the psychological and cultural implications of, are we doing tight silhouettes or loose silhouettes? Are we raising the waistline? Are we lowering the waistline? Are we revealing a lot or are we covering it up? Um, you just wanna get used to doing research into those things. And I promise you that that, that will pay off more in your art than um, pretending that you can ever become marvelous designer, which I don't think is possible. Actually, going to put that whole bottom area of the torso into shadow instead of breaking it up with light shapes. I'll model it with reflected light because I'm a madman. <laughs> Would you recommend studying real clothing or more costume design for movies? Uh, real clothing. You know, both are useful. It's just that um, costume designs for movies are like fit to the shot. Um, they're pinned, they're gathered carefully. There's definitely something to be learned there. And it's also um, there they are groomed for um, they're groomed to tell the story of the character. So when you get to studying the like, the storytelling aspects of design, you're gonna wanna look into what it's how those are used in movies. But in the beginning, um, you're, you're gonna learn so many counterintuitive and just interesting things from learning about real clothing as opposed to stuff in movies. It's like you need the depth at a certain point. You need, you need to let the world kind of blow your mind with just how complicated things actually are. It's 
step one for becoming a designer is uh, letting yourself be humbled by just how complex things are. I'm an environment concept artist focused on architecture, vehicles, things. Will it, be for, will it be better for me to also get into character designs or just focus on what? You should always do what you are genuinely, what are you most interested in? That, that's always the way to go. Art is a cruel mistress in that regard. Like if your if your main interest, if you find yourself thinking more about architecture, vehicles, and things more than characters, don't worry about characters. There's nothing in the rule book say you have to love characters. Would you advocate more to specialist or generalist? Um, even that is based on your personal preference. Um, like a lot of people bring up the idea of being a generalist or being a specialist in terms of what makes it easier to get a job. And if you ask different art directors, you're gonna get different answers. Art directors at one company are gonna say you're stupid if you're not a specialist, while art directors at another company are gonna say you're stupid if you're not a generalist. That's because in the world of art, even commercial art, no job is actually synonymous with another one. Creative projects by the nature of being creative um, rarely repeat the same things over and over again. They need problems to be solved and different problems need to be solved in different ways. So on the job side, it's difficult to actually say what's better for getting a job, generalist or specialist. But, I, but what I wanna bring up here is that as an individual, as an artist, divorced from worries about jobs, you can still ask yourself, do I prefer to be a specialist or a generalist? Am I the kind of person who just obsesses over one particular thing or am I the kind of person who loves having a broad base and likes doing different things all the time? 
um, I think that you should make that evaluation for yourself and that you should go with whatever aligns more with your temperament. Do you think it's best make one portfolio first or working on two? Um, I think make one. Because to... The thing is that most people will almost inevitably need to do two, but that's just because they can't focus on one. People naturally get distracted and, you know, the more work you put into one, you kind of your brain resists you. It's like, ah, I want to do something else. So it's almost inevitable that you will do more than one portfolio. But if we're speaking strictly, like what would be the most efficient? What would be the most useful for presenting your work to the world? Uh, I believe it would be to do one because um, a good portfolio, probably it takes over a year to make for most people. So that's a long time. And if, uh, if you're gonna do two, then you're stretching it to two years. And then it's very likely that uh, if you're not prepared for that or you're gonna get surprised by those numbers that you're going to be disheartened when you see how long it's gonna take and then you're gonna burn out quicker, you're gonna uh, wanna quit. I think one, pour your energies into one, try to focus on it as much as you can. Take breaks, do other things as you need to to maintain your sanity, but um, a single good portfolio is already a, takes a very long time to make. Just checking it without the line, seeing if the form holds up, even with only one value. And it does. You can still tell what the character is, even with the one value. trying to think about what skinny tone I want to use. Hold on everybody, I gotta use the restroom. I will be right back. Come in. Oh, hello, Joseph. 
Is it? Hi, Dr. Zapata. Yes. Joe, Joe, how are you? I'm well. What seems to be the problem, Joe? Well, I'm having trouble, uh, difficulty drawing from imagination. Oh. Joseph, just so you know, that's totally normal. Why don't you tell me a little more about your problem? Is it that you can only draw from imagination if you're completely alone? Doc, I can't ever draw from imagination. What about if you're completely relaxed? When I'm totally relaxed, I can't imagine a thing. I see. Uh, Joseph, it's important to know that even with severe cases like this, there's always hope. I can prescribe an experimental therapy called Form from Imagination. Form from Imagination? Mm -hmm. It's early days, but clinical trials are extremely promising. Why don't you try this for six months and then check back in with me? Hmm? Okay, I'll do whatever it takes. Did you just draw this? Oh yeah. Wow, it's, it's amazing. I, hey. Doc, do you ever have trouble drawing from imagination? Oh, no. No. <laughs> you wouldn't. I mean, you do this. That's right. Wow. Born from imagination is an experimental therapy and is not yet approved for use by the FDA. Do not use form from imagination if you are already taking any prescriptions for drawing from reference, working sight size, or tracing photos you didn't even take. Stop taking form from imagination if you experience any of these side effects. Loss of interest in your personal projects. Megalomaniacal self-confidence hallucinations, unless they're the kind you're hoping for, drawing better than Steven Zapata, or feelings that purchasing the course was enough and you don't really need to do the exercises. Call your doctor if you have stiff gestures, flat forms, or boring ideas to address a possible life-threatening condition. Full sketchbooks have been reported with form from imagination and medicines like it. Other risks include long-term art careers, too many clients, and being worth more than you're charging for. Call your doctor today and ask about form from imagination. How do you stretch or make more artboards in Photoshop? Crop tool. You can't make more artboards in Photoshop. You can only crop the one canvas at a time. Great acting. You did do great, Joe. You're my beautiful little acting boy. You're glistening. I'm rubbing you down with oil. I mean, uh, I'm proud of you for being in my commercial. Hold on, I gotta compost my banana peel. Compost in my banana peel. Put my banana peel in the bag in the freezer. Oh. Compost in my banana peel. Oh. What characters did you design for ESO? Uh, I did all sorts of stuff. Um, I mostly did environmental work, but in the process of doing that environmental work, I wound up concepting. Um, a lot of the uh, Khajiit races, the subspecies within the Khajiit, I wound up concepting them. They had never been seen before. Um, and I also did, damn, what's his name? Who's the main god in the world of Elder Scrolls? Something with an A. His like right hand man um, in the lore, his number two guy. Uh, I did the, uh, the concepts for him as well. It's been a while, the names are escaping me. I want to say it was something with an X. Sarces or something like that.
Akatosh. Yeah, he has some sort of a right-hand man. He's got like some um, some number two guy that he had some lore experiences with. I did the concepts for that number two guy so that I could put them on a statue together. There was some statue that needed to honor their relationship. And he'd never been seen before, so I had to concept him. I thought that was my phone just now. Is it, is it the music? My music was too loud. But you worked in house or as a contractor? Contractor for a long, uh, long stint. I was there for over a year. Just pretty long for any contractor type job. Great town, great town. I'm sure that town is very nice. <laughs> I was there once, I went down at the beginning of the gig to go visit the studio and to get onboarded and stuff like that. They flew me down and I spent a few days there with the team. But, um, you know, I just... Uh... When, uh, when other possibilities emerged, I was like, it would have been real rough to go from New York City to... It's just a very quiet town. Very, very quiet town. I wasn't ready for that at that point in my life. No, why'd I flip? Do you prefer to work as a contractor over in-house? What's the benefits over the risks? Um, it depends where you are in your career. You know, like these days I would, um, I, I'm not sure what it would take to make me work in-house these days. You know, it, it needs to be a very particular, a very particular job. It's just, um, You know, I don't like, um, I mean, this, this gets pretty into the weeds. And like I said, this is all particular, right? But, um, I'm pretty fast, you know? Um, and 
I always stumble over this stuff because I don't want to, I, I want people to understand that I'm not calling out any particular companies or anything like that, but um, I'm pretty fast. And I get things done a lot of the time quicker than people can serve up new tasks. And for me, historically, that has resulted in me spending a lot of time in staff positions or at the office sitting on my hands. And it, it's nice to get paid for sitting on your hands, but I'm just not happy like that. I'm just not happy like that. I, um, I'm a very productive person. I like feeling like all of the creativity that I can muster can go to productive use whenever it's ready. Um, and that that's just much easier to do when uh, I make my own schedule and every literally everything that I make and do can be shown, can be shared. Uh, if I take a job, it's all freelance, so I don't need to, um, as soon as I'm done with it, it's over, you know? I don't need to sit around pretending that I'm working or anything like that. I much prefer it this way. But isn't many companies now moving to a hybrid mode? Some, but not all. Not all companies like that. Final Fantasy 1 is on sale. You got it. You got it. That is correct. That is correct. Your knowledge and application of form is top notch. Thank you, Jacob. It's my favorite thing.
Do you usually separate base color from light or you mix and match depending on the mood? I mix and match. Most of the time when I paint, I do it, um, if you go back to the previous stream, most of the time when I do stuff, I do it the way I painted these two guys. You know, a little bit of base um, flats for the base color separations, but then I just paint all together in a suit over it. This guy just felt like, um, I felt like doing his col his values and lighting, or his the values for his lighting, I felt like doing in a separate pass, just because um, his body position really made it obvious that that would be a good way to go. Sorry if this question was already asked before, but do you know when the new Proco episode about AI is coming out? I do not, unfortunately. Uh, I was hoping it would come out last week, but I do not. That is up to uh, Stan and his team. It is their video, and uh, I'm not the one putting in the work to edit it. Uh, so I'm assuming it's just whenever they're done editing it, because uh, having edited a few interviews myself, um, it's not the easiest of tasks to interview, to edit together three people talking to each other, talking over each other, all with separate video feeds and audio feeds that they recorded on their own side. And we must have been talking for easily over two hours. So it's not, um, it's, it's a bit of a lift for an interview, so. You ever done a mural, would you? I have not, um, I don't really have much interest in mural work. I like a lot of artists who do murals. It's just not my, um, not my thing. I won't count it out in the future though. Do a yellower tone, it makes it more disgusting.
Not even as a vanity project? Friend, when you're me, everything's a vanity project. The character dancing next to the big troll kind of looks like you. <laughs> kinda. Dog, that is me. That's it right there. But really, all of the goblins are me. That's why they're my favorite thing to draw, because reference abounds. I'm reminded how to draw them every time I go to the bathroom. Andre Kling says, but isn't goblins very small? <laughs> I'm ashamed. I'm sorry to, to hear that you're trapped with such a small mind, that you can't expand out your beliefs and let your creativity roam, that you think there's rules to goblins. No one tells me what a goblin is or isn't, and I don't think anyone should tell you what a goblin is or isn't either. You think this is funny? You think this is a joke? You think this is something to take lightly? Goblins are serious business. And our metaphysical beliefs around goblins indicate who we are as people deep down. So don't you ever come back in here with that ignorant bull. I'm getting heated now. I gotta calm down. I gotta remember what I learned in my anger management classes.
Does Porky Pig count as a goblin? Yeah, I'd say so. Thousand percent. He fits the bill for sure. Have you ever been to Europe, Steve? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Last time I was in Europe, I was in Italy last year. I was in the hallowed halls of art. Checking out those Renaissance masterpieces. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm To see a Bernini and a Michelangelo in person is amazing. You bet it is. It's an embarrassment of riches over there, man. I hope to go back. There's more I want to see.
What's the music called? This is Divine Comedy by O oh, the City. There's a link to the playlist. DKMB says, what do you think of the War of Art? Um, I read it a long time ago. Uh, I remember it being good. I can't say I, I can recall many specifics from it. Yo, yo, what's poppin', says Josco. Dude, nothing's poppin'. I guess everything's poppin' now that I think about it. I guess when you really think about it, what isn't poppin', you know? Everything is actually poppin'. Now I'm getting overwhelmed just thinking about how much is actually poppin'. I'm like, oh my god. Things are poppin' off. Things are popping off and popping out. Just poke at our boy here for a while. Poke at our boy! So, I can save all of this stuff as legacy stuff. Tell you what I can do. I can dupe it all. Merge it. I'll make that red. Let me swipe teeth and eyes so that I have those. And then I can archive this stuff in case I do horribly bad things here. And we still got our line archive. Yeah, 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 yeah. And let's just paint on this guy for a bit. On what days Proko usually uploads videos? I don't know. I'm not quite sure what their usual upload schedule is. Are there any books you recommend for learning facial structure? Books. Um, you know, I think for the basics, um, videos are really best. Because there, there's a lot of them free online. Um, Proko's basic free videos on his channel, they're getting kind of, they've been out for a long time. Um, there's some of his older videos, but like, a, 
his video on like the Loomis head and things like that. I think for just a base starting point, that's probably better than most books. You really just need to be willing to put in the, uh, the huge amounts of practice. Do you turn off the line for the final? Usually not. I usually blend them into the painting. So I keep them on a flat layer with the paint and then with the mixer brush with the smudge tool, I can blend them out a bit as I work. But for concept stuff like this, um, I generally don't mind them being a little visible. It's not a big deal for me. I don't really make things like this super refined. Bread Pirate says, woo, get informed from imagination today. Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you so much, Bread Pirate. You get the course. I mean, you get it. You get it because you got it and you're gonna get it, so you're gonna get it. I look forward to seeing your assignments. I do love when people get the course. Do you plan on any other courses on your FFI platform? My white whale, principles of design. The course I've always wanted to make the most. I've been planning on that for a long time. Spent a lot of last year working on principles of design, writing it out, making the curriculum, things like that. That will come. If I can do it the way I plan on, that'll be uh, some next level stuff, principles of design.
Hello to Pechon and hello to Sergeant Art 98. SGD Art 98. Nick Ravioli says, on the matter of design, what gives pieces a dark or horror aesthetic? We know when we see, but can you distill it down? Um, on the most meta level, I think, um, I think that, just wanna check, check in with myself and see if I really believe this before I say it. Um, Yeah, I think so. Um, I think horror is actually completely dependent on content. I don't think any color scheme, any value scheme, any range of values or colors or arrangements or lun luminosity or anything like that. Um, I think the old classics there, like underexposure, spotlighting, desaturated colors, I think that all of those can be shorthands to horror, but I think if your goal is actual horror, not, you know, like this stuff is not horror, right? This is, you could imagine making a horror scene with a character like this, but this drawing doesn't feel like horror. I mean, they're just, cool stuff, right? If you're going for stuff that's genuinely scary, I think the only, to me, the only artistically honest thing you could say is that it's dependent on content. You need to make something that is truly scary. And scary is not a particular value scheme or color scheme or something like that. You need to, um, it needs to be unsettling on a content level. Like what someone could say about the piece should be disturbing. You know, it's it's never gonna live just on a purely aesthetic choice, I don't think. And people find different things very scary. I've had pieces that I made that I thought were like, um, uh, not, not at all frightening. Um, I've had people message me about them and, uh, say that they were genuinely scared of them. It's like, it's totally subjective. Pointy triangle shapes? Mm, nope, I don't agree. Can't say I agree with that. I, I don't think any shape language, um, if that were true, then the back of a Lamborghini Diablo would be horrific. <laughs> Pointy triangle shapes can just make things look cool just as easily as they can make something look horrifying. Grote one word, grotesque? No, I don't think even grotesquery guarantees, um, Again, like what I'm drawing right now is grotesque, but it's not horrific. No one would say it's horrific. The nature of this picture of this character is like, you might say, oh, he looks fun to fight in a game or something like that. He, that's not horrific, you know? You could maybe make him horrific if you brought in the other shorthands, if you put him in spotlighting and desaturated him and made it so you couldn't see his whole body and you know everything in the environment is wet or something like that. But um, 
No, I, I don't. I really, if I'm being as artistically honest as I can, I really don't think any, um, any easily said thing like that will lead you to horror. And um, if you're if you're genuinely interested in making horror, I think it would be very miss, uh, it would be bad of me as an art teacher to imply that it could, because um, horrific things need to be unexpected. They need to come from a place where people are a little shocked that you would do that, you know? I think that's the stuff that's truly horrific. So anything that's bound to something like a rule um, is actually gonna make that harder in the long run. Samuel Thompson says, how would you say controlling the con, how would you say controlling the context also plays a role? Cute bubbly stuff can be terrifying if given the right design and content. Yeah, I really think so. I often think of, um, you know, this is one of the ones where it's like it really just, this is probably an example of it landing in a horrifying way, particularly to me, to me as a particular person. But I often think of, um, if you guys have ever seen Pride and Prejudice with, um, What's her name? The newer one, not one of the older versions of Pride and Prejudice, but um, the newer Pride and Prejudice with a, oh, okay, let me just, I don't know, how am I forgetting the name of, is it Kira Knightley? Yeah, Pride and Prejudice with Kiera Knightley. I often think of that cut where the guy she doesn't want to marry hands her the flower, puts it down on the table and there's this long silent cut that's way too long, just looking at the flower. I find that genuinely horrifying. <laughs> I find that shot genuinely horrifying. It's like really anything can be made to be scary. And that is a beautifully exposed shot. It's a flower, it's a lovely flower. It's a marriage proposal. Um, if you, if you play it right, you can make anything scary.
Always got to take your time on the head. I'm afraid of the Pinocchio, especially when he turns into a donkey. Yeah, dude. What is the stuff I have found scary? Um, so not everybody's a fan of this, but I always thought the shot of the alien walking between the bushes in the home video of the party in Signs, uh, that image scares the shit out of me. So that one I think is an example of, it violates a lot of the rules of what we would think make something scary. Um, not all of them, but some of the big ones, you know? It's well lit, you know? It's a bright, sunny day uh, in that shot. And that actually makes it more frightening. And I find that truly frightening. I don't find that frightening the way a enemy in a game is frightening because it's dripping with blood. That's just like exciting to fight. That shot that is well exposed and bright is made scarier by the fact that it is clear, that in the context of that shot, it's like it is a clear proof of the monster. It's very, very, to me, I know a lot of people make fun of it, but um, I was horrified of that as a kid and I only come to respect that shot more and more um, as I think back on it. I really like that one. That's something that I find genuinely scary. It is, you know, also, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of aliens, but um, to a certain extent, you're gonna be afraid of the stuff you're afraid of. It's also in a, the, the monster is in an uncomfortable position, you know, it's not, it's not like he's hulking and rearing up or something like that. It's like, if you were gonna ob obey the rules of horror, you would just never get to that shot, which like it or not, we all have to admit it's legendary, right? We would all be lucky to make anything that has that kind of an impact on, um, on the zeitgeist, because the way most things go like that is not even that people remember it and like, huh, it's like, they don't remember it at all. It means nothing, it doesn't leave an impact.
going on here? In your opinion, what's a good way to study proportions while something is foreshortened? Um, I think that particular problem is unfortunately, there's very few ways around it besides brute forcing the issue, as far as I can tell. You just gotta look at a lot of reference of um, the particular foreshortened structure you wanna, you wanna understand. And you gotta break it down. You don't necessarily need to copy it a million times, but you need to analyze, you need to analyze thoughtfully. You need to look at the references and ask yourself, what really makes this thing still look like what it is, even though it has departed from its platonic ideal, shape-wise? the heck is this? If you go in equipped with a good understanding of the basic form of the thing, because the forms don't change, right? It's, they're being affected by perspective. So if you understand the basic forms well, right? You're, if you're trying to learn how to foreshorten an arm, it's gonna be much more difficult if your basic conception of the shame, shapes of the arm is too simple. It doesn't capture the nuance of the arm. Um, so you need a nuanced understanding of the forms of the subject and then you need to sit there and analyze and like how are these things being affected by perspective and which, which aspects of the form are important to maintaining the read when foreshortened and which aren't. I know, I wish there was an easy answer, but there's a reason foreshortening is, a, is one of the most legendarily difficult things in drawing. It has resisted our efforts to simplify it.
nice bounce lighting. I don't mess around. I just don't mess around. Other people mess around, but not Stevie Boy. Gonna work around the speculars for now. Gonna leave them for last. Gonna be disciplined. Are you using soft round or hard round plus smudge? I jump around a little bit to both. Right now, mostly the uh, hard round and then smudging. I do do a lot of painting with the soft brush though, generally speaking. 
definitely one of my favorite tools. Hey Renola, what's up? Oh yes. Oh yeah yeah. My mood is up. Oh god, yes. That's what we all need. Good moods. Mood up everybody. Mood up. You're sitting there, you're drawing, or you're thinking about drawing. You're in a wonderful and privileged position to have a free moment to think about drawing or to draw. Muda, muda. Enjoy it, soak it up. Is this Photoshop? The layoff is throwing me off? Yes, it is. They're just plugins. If you're interested in the plugins, there are links in the description to the two that I'm using. Mood is deaf up, doing some gesture drawing, which I normally struggle with, uh, struggle with mindset, but this morning has gone a lot better. Nice, nice, Leela. Leela? Leela. Leela. Wow. Growing the goblin family, family, Stephen, you bet. My fecundity is legendary within goblin circles. Mac or PC, curious for the plugins. I'm on a Mac. 
If you're gonna go heavily into plugins though, PC would be the way to go. But these two work for Mac. Layla like the Clapton song. See, that makes it easy. Layla, you got me on my knees, Layla. I beg you, darling, please, Layla. Darling, won't you ease my worried mind? Got the same spinal alignment as me. Now that's funny. Michael Schlater says in eight years, NASA wants people living on the moon in a moon station. Who will be the first creating art on another surface than the Earth? It's gonna be me, Michael. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that NASA is a huge fan of me and that every single one of my drawings is instanced in every single cubicle of everybody working at NASA. Guaranteed, promised, fact, proven. It's in documentaries. So who's the first artist they're gonna throw up there? It's gonna be your boy. They're gonna make a custom studio for me out in some crater. It's gonna have a beautiful view. I'm gonna be drawing goblins to the earth rise, baby. I'm gonna be streaming with a nine second delay as I transmit from the moon. How long is the delay from the moon? What's the communications delay? It's probably more than nine seconds. I'm gonna guess 13 minutes. That's what I guess the communications delay is to the moon. And then I'll be able to say, honestly, that I'm the best artist on the planetoid. Getting a lot of conflicting opinions on what the communications delay is to the moon. I need you guys to sort this out. Two point five seconds, they say. Two point five. I think we could have a pretty good stream from the moon then. I don't think it'd be that hard.
Hold on, I gotta talk to my wife. What's your process when designing your shapes for a commercial project where I guess that working within constraints begs to be more methodical than when free drawing? Do you have a practical example? Um, usually when I do, when I'm working in design, I'm solving a pretty base level problem. So when we're talking about designing shapes in that situation, it's mostly just using shapes that are characteristic of the subject or the reference. Um, so for example, you know, when you say designing shapes, you might be asking in the sense of like, how do you design beautiful shapes for a painting? You know, how do you make the light shape nice or the shadow shape nice? And when I work professionally, because I'm a designer and I, I rarely get hired for straight illustration, I get hired for design work. Um, I don't usually get to that level. Usually I'm solving a problem like, um, what should a statue carved out of stone of a jellyfish look like? Those are hard problems, yeah? A jellyfish is a very ethereal thing. It has very soft surfaces. What would it look like if it was made out of stone? What nature of cracking and bending and texture and what kind of edges could you get? What kind of undercuts could you get? that would capture the feeling of a jellyfish in, in a, a material that has some dissonance like stone. Um, those are shape questions, but they're not the painting shape questions that we normally think of. Those shape questions are being driven by the nature of the material and the actuality of the task. It's saying that um, something like undercuts, right? Like I need to have a, I need to go easy on the dark accents in the areas around the tentacles because that would imply more undercuts that could reasonably be done in stone and it'll make it look like the tentacles are gonna fall off. I need to find some way to group the tentacles instead into large groups that can connect down to the base and make it realistic that it would support the weight of the statue. Those, in my experience as a designer, are more the shape questions that come up and nobody really gives a good goddamn how nicely I design the, the shapes of the light in abstractum. It always becomes relevant only to the design problem. So the shapes that I use to paint the light might become a problem if they don't, if they're not indicating, for example, that um, this is a planar surface. So there should be a planar breakup to the light shape thereby subdividing the light shape in order to communicate that even the smooth dome at the top of the jellyfish has been carved out of stone. Sam Lamb, how are you? Just joined and immediately see strong daddy vibes on the screen. I just don't mean the drawings. Also, Steven Zapata, it's really what I'm here for. Hello, Sam, how are you, my dear friend? Do your goblin children ever talk to you? If yes, what do they say? Uh, they do talk to me. Um, they mostly ask the same questions all children ask. They wanna know, why is the universe here? Why is there something it's like to be me? What is the interface between consciousness and material? You know, same old stuff. Same things all children ask. Though the radiation might not allow you to stream at all, right? Uh, well, you know, I mean, we'll find a way. We'll find a way. I'm not saying there's no technical problems to be solved to do the moon stream, but, you know, we're humans. We're industrious. We're going to find a way to do it for sure. 
Domo says, did you just break an art rule with that arm to thigh tangent? How could you, Steven? I did break an art rule. And that is why the art police are gonna break down my door any second now. Rest assured, they're coming. They don't let you get away with anything. Let's throw some specs on this guy so that we can evaluate the whole value range. Floating workspace mandatory, oh my God, yes. Oh my god, yes. I gotta go back and model up the, the eyes on this guy more. I'm in space. I'm Steven in space. Everybody understands the importance of my space streams. Ain't you ever caught the intro? We live in a future heavily influenced by the technology given to the world by my stream. Bears. <clears throat> I think I might eat on stream today. Since my dog isn't here. Oh God, how I miss my little doggy. <laughs> Home is far too empty without her. Every time I go from one room into another, I always expect to hear the little pitter patter of her feet and they're not there. Do a mukbang. You want to watch me eat an entire crave crate from White Castle? I mean, you've seen me eat plenty of bad stuff, man. Bad stuff in high volumes. Would it really even be that interesting to you? considering our years of friendship and shared food consumption.
Gobbly knows you're the one. Yes, yes, we all have fun. I'm on the multiple nipple train, man. I love giving beasties multiple nipples. <laughs> Shit, man. There's just something about it. There's just something about giving them multiple nipples. Yes, 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 yes. Where's the goblin baby suckling on the teats? Man, it's like, if I really had it in me, if I was really a good artist, I would take the time to add the baby. I'd add the little goblin baby suckling on the teeties. Like you do, as you do. Ben Hillman says, I can't even bear to eat while watching the stream for, far, for fear of Steven judging me. How's watching him eat the flesh of a smaller, weaker artist going to fix that? Oh my God. Steven, do you believe someone can, re can become a really great artist without practice for practice sake and only doing projects? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, it'd be a huge amount of projects, but yeah, you could definitely do it. It's just that you might become a different kind of great artist than you're imagining right now. Your perception of what makes a great artist is biased, is prejudiced, as everybody's is. So the artist who only did projects, even if it was you, right, might be rehearsing by doing that a skill set that doesn't necessarily lead to the outcome that you're envisioning, but they can still arrive at a place where they are undeniably a great artist. Even if they don't have, I don't know, the facility with line work that you currently envision as being necessary to be considered a great artist, they may have a mind with incredible creative alacrity, an ease with problem solving, and an ability to solve incredibly difficult creative problems on schedule over and over and over again that they then exercise over and over and over again and produce products and projects that change the world and that influence others. It would be undeniable that they're a great artist. They might just never rehearse the obsessively refined line work that you like.
Boxer Wing says, I entered my first art show last weekend. Many thanks to Steven Zapata Art because his videos were the spark for me to start drawing a little over a year ago. Aw, that's awesome, Boxer Wing. Congratulations, congratulations on your first art show. That's, uh, that's nuts. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have contributed to your journey in whatever small way I have. Congratulations on having a real relationship with your creativity. Many blessings to you, Boxer Wing. Is there any good argument against giving up? Making art does not fight anybody. You are just producing uh, arm pieces that will soon be made by machine. If anything, you help it a little bit with extra data. Um, you mean on the AI side? Are you specifically talking about the AI stuff? Are you specifically asking, um, is there any good reason not to give up? in light of artificial intelligences? Is that what you're saying? If that is what you're saying, yes, reasons abound. It'd be hard to pick one. <laughs> Yes, the AI stuff. Yeah, uh, to be clear, even if it was a situation a thousand times more dire than AI, um, there's never a good reason to not make art. And uh, yeah, I mean that as radically as possible. And you may not like that, a lot of people might not like that, but I really do mean that. So just to, to take it to the ad absurdum, um, I think there's perfectly good reason to make art in the middle of war, like if you're in war. And there's a long history of that. We used to send uh, artists to the front lines to draw pictures of the people there uh, and the events that were going on. And we still did that long after there was photography as well. Um, I think there's good reason to make art in the middle of a family tragedy, even one that's urgent, even one that's going on that day. Uh, I personally found myself sneaking little doodles into my life in the middle of my father's tragic death, death by suicide. Um, yeah, I, I mean it in the most absolute and most far-flung sense. I think there's good reason always to be making art, no matter how dire the circumstances. The main reason is that art is not a, a commodity. It's not a product. Um, you, can, you can experience your relationship with your art that way if you like, if that's what you prefer. Um, you can jump back and forth, but yeah, art is not a, a commodity, it's not a product. It's a, it's a part of you if you honestly engage with the nature of your relationship with it. It is driven by an urge to express your ability to create, which is a very, very, very profoundly deep thing. It seems to be aligned with um, fighting against nihilism. Uh, some part of it is a, a deep desire to have some influence on the chaotic entropy that is slowly tearing the universe apart. Um, it is not a mere or small thing. It is a grand thing, even if it is occasionally done in mere circumstances. And I think that especially for people who feel the urge to do it in a deep way, as you might if you're asking questions like that, um, even if you're not sure what the incentives are on the other side of doing it, even if you're not sure if you can make money off of it, if you can get status off of it, if you can make a career out of it, it's often useful to look at what are the consequences of not making art when you have the urge to do so. And those consequences are pretty dear. Um, I think you, we've all met people, and if you haven't yet, I'm sure you will, and this can become you. It can kill your soul to not make art 
if you feel like you should and like you want to. It can produce a kind of creative constipation that is existentially tormenting and can be extremely damaging. So even just on those grounds, I think it's always a good idea to make art if you feel like you want to. Goodbye, Andre Kling. Good luck with the kids. I Smile Art says, I really want to take form from imagination, but I just signed up for four studio classes next semester. So to avoid information overload, I'm going to wait until summer. I think that's good. Don't overload yourself. We'll be here whenever you're ready. Would you recommend taking form from imagination in conjunction with other art instruction? Um, you can. I don't, I don't have any specific recommendations there. Um, it's a very, very involved um, course. If you wanted to do all of the assignments, it would take you easily over half a year. Um, so there, that means that it, uh, it on its own can definitely fill a lot of your educational diet, but um, that also means that there's plenty of time and room to divert into other things as well. It depends on your appetite for uh, instruction, how much you can bear to have going on at once. Sam Lamb says, this is unsurprisingly a nuanced question. This weekend I was stoked about a thumbnail I drew and when I developed it, I hit a wall as I was trying to clarify the design for my character's clothing. I faced a crossroads. Pick at the sketch so if something would, to see if something would give or step away to go study how the clothing might appear in this pose. Insights into how one develops discernment for choosing one path versus the other. Mm, like you said, it's nuanced. My gut usually goes to getting reference if you are at the point where you know you've hit a wall, right? Because you can usually feel in your guts like, am I being a little, uh, am I just being a little lazy? You know, lazy sounds negative, but not like that. You can just kind of tell when you're like, all right, I know the work I would need to do here. I just kind of don't feel like doing it. Um, do you know that you could work that piece of fabric out if you sort of did some side sketches or scraped it down and then did it fresh? Um, if you're feeling that, then yeah, I think you can just keep to, you can just keep burrowing down on the sketch. But if you really feel you've hit a wall where you're just like, Ugh, you're just you look at it at the problem area and you're just neutral, you're just confused. You're like, well, I don't know. I think that's the time to go get reference for sure. Go look for something that looks like that fabric. Go shoot yourself in a similar fabric. I think that's 
uh, a perfectly fine time to do it. Especially if the, um, this is, this is specifically for creative pieces like you're thumbnailing for. I think it's especially a good idea for very creative pieces if that piece of fabric is pivotal to the nature of the piece. So um, like the piece that we did together, if you have a robe that you know the character is going to be in a robe, if you don't understand the robe very well yet, I think it's a good idea to look at reference and get reference for it early because deeper knowledge of the fabric will influence the choices you will make about the overall composition. So in that case, I think it's extra useful to get familiar with the nuances of, of the drapery or the fabric early on. So uh, to put that more succinctly, it's like, well, let me do a little, It's like, let's say that you know your character wears a cape, like a red cape, right? If you're operating while you're doing your sketches on the idea that this is what capes look like, you're gonna keep reiterating that concept in your thumbnails, and you're gonna do that over and over and over again, and you're going to be hamstrung a little bit by your limited understanding of that particular design feature, right? So even if you bang your head against it and it's like, well, I'm doing it from imagination, I'm doing it from imagination, it's really just, you know, it's, it's, it's not really that noble because you're just repeating that concept. But if you went and looked at photographs of people twirling in capes and things like that, and you saw a lot of the crazy shapes that it makes when they're doing particular moves, like that, then you're gonna be ready to reintegrate those shapes into the designs and they're gonna make the thumbnails radically different because a thumbnail that is based on that just doesn't have as much flexibility as a thumbnail that has more understanding of how the cape reacts to something like wind. It's like, that's a radically different thumbnail. It completely transforms the nature of the sketch and the nature of the layout. So if it's a particularly important design feature, I think it's better to get reference very early so that you can iterate more wildly in the thumbnails. Yeah, so Sam says, fantastic insight and well describes what I went through. In case anyone is curious, the wall I hit was the neutral confused wall. I just didn't know how the robe should sit in that pose. Yeah, so I think that's a very good, if you know you're in that neutral state where you're just, com where you're just completely stumped, it's like, that's the time to go check some stuff out. It'll spur new ideas.
<laughs> we at church today, Stephen. Light bulb went off. This is a great insight into the dialectic interrelationship between knowledge of subject matter and the capacity to design that subject matter. You got it, baby. That's it right there. Joe says, so you're saying I should buy a sheet and have my partner photograph me jumping off the couch in the apartment like Batman. Yes, that is what I'm saying. I have a... I personally have a very embarrassing photo, folder of photos of myself for reference purposes. <laughs> it is couched like six folders deep. It's like the first one is called like self shots. And then the next you click in there's a folder that says self shots, some are naked. And it says self shots, I mean it, very NSFW. And then ne next folder is like, don't do this to yourself. And the next one is you, you asked for it. I really, you know, I can't recommend this. And then just the whole parade of depravity is unveiled. Please post to Instagram stories, thank you. I th I th Joe has seen a few that I've censored. I'm <laughs> pretty sure. I think I've sent you guys some. Some of them are just really funny. <laughs> some of them are just really funny. Sometimes like my dog's in the background like looking at me like, oh God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just remembering some of them. They're really bad. Anything for the art. I just saw the Heidi Klum worm costume footage yesterday. Truly incredible, and I thank you for putting me onto it, Stephen. No problem, Noah. I, I really, as I say in that podcast, God bless her. I mean, I really, I'm, she's the best. That's so cool that she does that. I, I think that's what I would do if I had her money, and it's just amazing that she actually does it. I'm inspired by her. All right, I, gotta, I really got to use the restroom again, and I'm going to grab my sandwich, and then we'll keep going here. So I will be right back. Who's that, Steven? It's Gamgul, Steven! How you holding up out there, Steve? I'd say considering I'm fighting a Steven who doesn't draw, I'm doing all right, really. Ha! <laughs> Just try to keep everyone entertained while you try to keep your head. I need more time in Cathar Steven's palace. I know the god Graphite is here. Somewhere in here. If I only knew where. Hey, no rush, man. I got this guy on the ropes. Trust me. Yeah! Usenya Thunder! Dumecha Madito! 
dunia na nyata da kiyata. <laughs> Wah? What? It, it's Incanthia, great sword of the Black Fountain. He, he really does have it. Yeah, Nidroya. Yeah, Nitsuyo Tufu, Gimya Tan. This is a dream of Steven. Steve, Steve, are you there? Steven, uh, you got to the ship. How do you get past the blockades? Nothing the dream couldn't handle. But they're on me, and we're coming in hot. I'm gonna get you out of there. Do I have clearance to murder some citizen Stevens as I strafe the arena? Soon, but not yet. Sturvin needs more time in the palace to find the god graphite. If you attack now, all the guards watching my execution will rush back to the palace to secure Cathar Steven. So give him the runaround until I get word from Sturvin. The, the God Graphite, finally. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. Well, yes, uh, come to Sturvin. Hold on. No need to rush there, little Steven. You and I both know Stave wouldn't want you to get sloppy and spill any of that, would he? <laughs> I almost sloppily spilled all of that, for sure. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Steven, inquiring minds want to know what's in the sandwich. This is a uh, cream cheese and cucumber. Very light. Damn, was I hungover yesterday. Real hungover yesterday from Saturday. Steven, I'm saving for your course. Probably I will get it next year. Please don't stop selling it. <laughs> I won't. I'm not gonna stop selling it. <clears throat> what do you guys wanna do? You wanna look at ArtStation? See what's on our station.
Pretty cool. Aness Dirig. Girls, 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 girls. A lot of Overwatch 2 guns. Is it all the same person? Looks like it. Lauren Brooch. Nice breakups. Hmm, I was looking at this guy the other day. Mm. Actually, this doesn't, it's the same design, but I was looking at a different render. It's weird. must be based on someone's concept that a bunch of 3D people have done versions of it. Yeah, I saved this one by Alexander Mujanot. I like that render a lot. I really like the uh, the flat exposure on the reptilian textures. It looks really cool. Even though alligators are usually like shiny, have a lot of speculars on them. It looks really nice flattened out like that. I like the form emphasis it has. I don't know who the original concept artist is for that concept. <clears throat> That's cool. Frazetta, Frazetta vibes. Igor Kier, Kieriluk. <laughs> the art station mukbang relaxation. Look, we all gotta eat food sometimes. How old are you? I am 32 years old.
Nice. Digital reconstructions of Barry St. Edmunds Abbey. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, man. Tomas Barcelo. Really like the finished patination. Much bigger than I thought it was, too. Really nice. Really nice material. Let me throw out my sandwich wrapper. I'll be right back. Give me a second. I got crap on my head. What are you looking for? Nothing. I was just poking around. Just scoping things out. All right, let's work a little longer here. Since my dog is gone, so I don't need to walk her. She's off at my in-laws. What's all this?
I thought something happened to Fanny. God, no. Sorry to have scared you. If something had happened to my little Fanny dog, I wouldn't be here. I would be really going through some shit. And I wouldn't be sitting here drawing goblins. I would be seeking the constant support of my family and friends. Stephen, is it fair to say that you've gone goblin mode? I suppose it is fair to say. How do you apply shape design in realism outside of patterns on clothing? Realism actually has a lot of flexibility. What is real? What defines real? You can push shapes pretty far from what you're seeing in reality and it will still read as realistic. You can also rely on different things to create the realism so that you can push other aspects. So for example, you can exaggerate the Let me just show you here. So you can exaggerate the two-dimensional clarity of a shape, right? So it's it's unlikely that you'll ever encounter a shape that's this stylized in reality in its two-dimensional silhouette. It's just so precise, it's so sharp. Life tends to be more broken up than this, more variegated. But if you take that shape and you let the form, that is to say the modeling factors in this case, the modeling factors do the lift of realism for you, So you make the interior drawing. More realistic. So you have soft edges variety of halftone transitions. Specular reflections were appropriate.
it will communicate realism to most people, right? An artist, you know, another specialist might have some way to sort of debate you on that, not that anybody ever would, but the by relying on the realistic lighting and rendering, you can go further with the line work than you would if you didn't get as realistic and as formy with the rendering. So you can use, you can also do the same move with a uh, color. You can have very realistic color to back up so-so uh, form rendering, or you might want to put the burden of realism on the lines. If you're gonna use very unrealistic color, it'll still feel realistic. There's all sorts of ways to compensate and you can bank your realism within different uh, design elements. Goodbye, Sam Lamb. We're happy to have you as always. Many blessings to you, sir.
work on our other guy for a little bit. Why not? Do 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 ba ba da ba 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 da ba. Stephen, do you know of any industrial design courses online? Industrial design? I don't, but I'm sure there are many. There's got to be um. There's got to be a lot of those because industrial design is pretty big. Maybe if you go to a site that gives like a architectural education or um, there's a lot of sites that focus around like a car design. I bet they would point you in the right direction for some sort of industrial design course. I know Art Center, where I went to school, um, they were beginning to add some online programs to their catalog, like just continuing ed slash anybody can take them. They were starting to do that when the pandemic started. Uh, I have not kept up with that, unfortunately. So maybe they've, uh, they've opened that up. And if I remember specifically, they were starting with car design stuff. So that would be pretty close to industrial design. So you might check out Art Center College of Design's website. Maybe someone in the chat has taken a good online industrial design course they can recommend. recommend. You read the title and thought I was telling you to buy Final Fantasy. That's funny. If I would just randomly want to encourage people to play the first Final Fantasy. Maybe I should change the title. Eh. People who want form from imagination, they know about it. They know what I'm talking about. David Dubois says, Art Center College of Design is there where you learn to design art colleges. That's right. I went to their, uh, I did my bachelor's in designing art colleges. That's why I'm pedagogically, gogogically equipped to create pedagogies for learning art.
Scott Robertson's books are good. <laughs> yeah, if you like accurate information. <laughs> yeah, if you like how stuff actually works, I guess. A long time ago, a long, long time ago, I can still remember. Um, I won't go, no, don't worry, I'm not gonna go all the way. I took a one unit intro to industrial design course at Art Center, the only class I ever took there. I was seeing if it spoke to me, but I was drawn to illustration instead. Ah, it happens that way to so many of us, doesn't it? A design education for me was also an education in how much I liked not designing. I got to come in both ways. Noah says, I dislike how much English I have to do in art school. Like, not fun English either. Research papers. Yeah, well, they gotta stay accredited somehow. That's the problem. It's all the, uh, the accreditations. Their cardinal sin. Misstep number one, art school. It's not a misstep if you want that degree, though. There's only one way they can give you that degree, and they gotta play ball with the accreditation boards to do it. People, they don't mean a thing to you. They move right through you, just like your breath. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I still think of you. And I just wanted you, just wanted you to know my own. I swear I never meant for this mm -hmm. I never meant Don't look at me that way It was an honest mistake Don't look at me that way It was an honest mistake. You see, this is why I have to play the music, because otherwise I start singing early 2000s hits uncontrollably. Need to play music to 
prevent myself from doing that. Do you know TV on the radio, Stephen? I do not. Are they early 2000s? What is all of the love for machines in the chat right now? We draw goblins on these streams. All this talk about cars and hard surface? You're in the wrong place, people. We like wiggly wagglies here. The adversary. The only reason I gave up on drawing that way was thinking you couldn't use a ruler. Yeah, I mean, Scott advises you freehand as much as you can in how to draw and all that, but, you know, you don't need to be Scott. It's totally okay to use a ruler. A lot of people seem to don't, don't, a lot of people don't seem to understand what the reason for the admonition against rulers was. Anyway, they, they seem to, th people seem to treat it like it really mattered if you were badass enough to do it with a ruler. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, they advise you to not do it with rulers under the belief that if you have to get a ruler out every time you want to sketch like that, you won't sketch like that. That you'll get too lazy to grab the ruler and that it'll just add too much time. Um, it was just a practical concern. Um, within that particular pedagogical viewpoint. But um, yeah, obviously, if that drawing method is useful to you, you can just do it with a ruler. You don't need to have the amazing hand dexterity to do, you know, freehand straight lines all the time. What if you quit drawing because you hate not using, using a ruler? Then how good was the advice? Yeah, I mean, that, that really just runs up against um, 
the um, the weird differences between artists and their beginning viewpoints that um, that most teachers they're not accounting for the whole broad uh, basis of viewpoints out there. It is it is fine advice, and there is something nice about being able to draw like that. But like the if you went to Scott, for example, and you told him that someone thought there was a real rule and the idea that they should not use a ruler or the idea that they should not use a ruler or some other tool would make them stop drawing because you like those rules are real and you need to follow them or something like that. If you told Scott that, Scott would be like, what? <laughs> like, that's so completely outside of the realm of understanding of someone like Scott. Like, Scott knows that, you know, there's nothing strict in art and that you can do whatever you want and that there's no, like, you know, no rules, no rules, only tools. Like, um, yeah, not, not all teachers are really, uh, are really operating on those wavelengths, you know? It's like, it was good advice. It's not that, it is good advice. It's not really Scott's responsibility to like disclaimer for kind of every crazy thing that somebody might think about drawing, you know? Not to speak for Scott, just based on my impression of him when I was one of his students. Scott wouldn't want anybody to stop drawing for any reason. You know, Scott really cares about art and he really wants people to uh, explore their creativity. He had a lot of technical opinions and a lot of technical knowledge, but Scott was a true art lover, is a true art lover. Layla says, interesting to hear you talk so much about pedagogy in this stream. In your opinion, Stephen, what is a pedagogical technique or idea that you think is missing from a lot of art education right now? The most common one, and specifically for online learning, in my opinion, is um, uh, not enough encouragement to do your own projects and to continue to be creative. That's actually not as big of a problem in school settings. Schools have a long history of encouraging that, and they have the context for it. Um, but in the online world, which has a great influence on people, 
it's sorely missing. And that's because um, there is no context for it. There is no structure set up for it. And online learning is more based on the salacious things that you can say about what you're gonna teach people. Um, and the problem with that is that all you can really hope to promise on is uh, the stuff that you think is like objective, but that's only a small portion of what you need to practice as an artist. So there's, um, that's the big thing in my opinion that's missing online. People just have no idea that even since they're a beginner, they should always be making the pictures that they want to make. They think that they're supposed to sort of focus on skills in an abstract way for years and years and years and not do their dream when um, you're supposed to always be being creative with your art. And you're always supposed to be, again, in my opinion, you are always supposed to be attempting the pictures that you dream of making, no matter how bad you suck. That's how you get better at them. Steven, I don't know why, but your art sometimes reminds me of Yoshitaka Amano. Huh. Well, that's very nice of you to say. I have to say, I don't know why either, though, because I feel like we our, our work looks nothing alike. But it would be hard to interpret a comparison to Yoshitaka Amano as anything but an effusive comment. So thank you. An effusive compliment, not comment. YouTube has emojis now. What the what? What the what? what? Oh, this no. Oh, I wish the stretch would never end. Oh, oh, it's so good. Okay. Honestly, I just want to be able to study and draw mechs all day. I've avoided it too long, even though it's something that got me into being creative. Yeah, so you got to do it. You can't just put it off forever. You've got to actually do the thing you like doing. Bro, my goblin sucks. <laughs> Is there anything sadder than a bad drawing of a goblin? Could anything be more disappointing? My God, my God, what is this leering farce that you've trapped us in? The world is an escape room, a joke by a cruel creator filled with mediocre drawings of goblins. <laughs> Is it a good or bad thing if one of your recent artworks is accused of being made with AI? I don't know how to feel about it as I put 20 or so hours into it. That is just the unfortunate, um, whoa, did I just close my brave? Wait, hold on. Okay, there we go. Um, that is just the unfortunate nature of the moment we're living in. Um, stay the course, don't worry about it. I doubt anyone will accuse the next one of being made by AI, and if they do, it's probably the same person who made the first accusation, and that'll let you know that they're trolling. Don't worry about it. Stay the course. Keep making work. Don't let it knock you off your path. A lot of weird stuff going on in the art world right now.
Gob looks gorgeous. Thank you. That's what I provide here. Gorgeous gobs. Gorgeous gobs. I really mean it, people. If um, things are strange in the online world um, around all of the AI stuff, um, yeah, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, trolling, a lot of lies. I don't want to get too deep into, um, some of the stuff that I suspect might be happening, but, um, my, um, my advice really is if you find yourself if you're just minding your own business and trying to make work and you're getting comments like what Matt Walker said, like I think this was made by an AI or something like that, my advice to you right now is to basically pretend it didn't happen. Because um, you don't know who the person on the other side is. You don't know their intentions. You don't know how serious they are. And we're already sensitive enough to being knocked to and fro by anything. Um, it would be very easy for a random comment like that, that you then overanalyze and you're like, oh, people think my art is AI generated because of the colors that I use. If you get that worm in your head, there's gonna be no way to undo it. Next time you're working, you're gonna avoid those colors, not because it's a good idea for the piece, but because you're worried that that is why people think your work is AI generated. And that would be very bad. That would be very, very bad um, because it's probably based on false pretenses. You know, the person didn't even really mean that. They're just fucking with you. Um, especially if things become tenser and tenser around the AI stuff, more and more people will do that. So my advice to anyone who encounters things like that for now is basically pretend it didn't happen. Pretend it didn't. I guess you're right because I've been trying to figure out why ever since. Exactly. It's not worth it. And you have no idea if they even really thought that. They might just be an AI, I don't know what else to call it, an AI troll who is purposefully running around and trying to say that on as many artists' accounts as possible just to sow dissent and confusion. So yeah, my best advice is don't even try to figure it out. Literally put it out of your mind, it doesn't matter. Steven, I must make my leave to eat something for the first time today. Go, Noah, go and eat and be joyful. Gob speed. May the goblins be with you. Take this goblin with you. It will protect you. Here's a full-size, large-grown, homespun goblin that I've shrunk down to an appropriate size for you to stuff down your pants. Take this large-spun, homespun, homegrown, large-sized, shrunk-down goblin with you to protect you as you go on your journeys, as you go on your adventures, as you go to work, as you talk to your boss. Feel the little goblin rummaging around down there in your pants as you talk to your boss, as you look him in the eyes, and he gives you orders, gives you tasks, tells you what to do to the day. As you punch your time card, as you ask for approval of your hour, as you drive, as you pump your gas at the gas station, take this goblin with you. It will protect you. It will keep you safe. Take him. 
Take him. I can't hold him for much longer. He'll bite my hand. Take him. Take him with you. Take him. Take him. He's yours now. Take him. Steven, I notice you rarely hit control Z to undo or erase your lines. Is that something that comes with time? Um, yeah, I, well, I, I don't know if it comes with time. It just comes from what I'm concerned with most of the time in my work. I'm mostly concerned with uh, overall forms and the bigger shapes. So an incidental line here or there is really not a big deal there. And because I'm doing rendering, it actually adds a little bit of texture and nicety to the work if I go over my mistakes instead of erasing them a lot of the time. It gives it some grunge. It gives it a, a little bit of a built up feeling. So it's mostly just an effect of that. I just know that for my kind of work, it's really not that big a deal to leave a few things in. If I was doing something that really relied on razor sharp line work that needed to be exact and clean, I would be undoing a lot. If this whole art thing doesn't work out for you, you could go into improv comedy for a living. From one hard living to another. <laughs> I imagine it's not easy to uh, support your family off of improv comedy, but it's on the table. Good to know. That MPC smile where you half paused and stopped yourself from working blue killed me. I'm, I'm glad detecting that can give you a laugh. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. What does, let me... Rusted iron. Seeing if it rusts kind of all over or in patches. Yeah, that'd be a nice touch to make the specular affect it differently in the parts that aren't rusted. It would be a very nice touch indeed. I won't do it because I'm too lazy to do the layer stack for that, but oh, that's a nice reference because I kind of imagined he was wearing almost cast iron pans on him. It's like a two-tone thing, the rust. You never failed to brighten my day, Stephen. I'm glad, Zella. That's what I'm here for.
Goodbye, John. Take care. Those poor mistreated pens. Yeah, they're having a rough go of it. I don't I don't use my cast iron because I know I can't be trusted to take care of it. It's like I would just rather never put it through that. The anatomical knowledge here is insane, says Average. No. The anatomical knowledge is not that impressive. What you need to be impressed by is our knowledge of how to take care of a cast iron pan. That's what's impressive. Everybody in this stream right now is up on that. They would never let a cast iron fall into disrepair. Especially not after years of good service. Be more careful. Ooh, it comes out so brown. Too much. Just 
going to leave it simple like that. Ooh. Got a good crack of the knuckles right there. Whenever you guys decide on a on a word for goblin breasts, you just let me know. You can add it to the lexicon. I forgot I have some ink nibs coming in the mail today to test out. That'll be fun to try out tonight. All hail goobies. They like goobies. Goobies it is. With these words from my mouth, goobies will forever be known in all the land as the technical term for the breasts of a goblin. Hail, goobies! From this day until the end of days. Hey, Steven, do you critique all the assignments in your course? You betcha. At least, I certainly try. As far as I know, I have not missed one. As far as I know, as of today, I have given feedback to every assignment. If I did miss one, it was certainly not on purpose. Just got lost somewhere in the shuffle. I usually get feedback. I usually give feedback to an assignment uh, within like two to three days. Sometimes it's the same day. It just depends how much feedback is sitting there. If I'm away from home or something like that.
Trevor Olson says, oh my gosh, did I really find myself on an actual live Steven Zapata stream? I love your stuff. I keep trying to catch you live, but my notifications never let me know when you go live. What, what, what's up with the notifications? What's up with that? Maybe there's something to this whole click the bell thing that YouTube people say over and over again. I've been watching your recorded live streams while I do my own drawing practice. I'm very happy to hear that, Trevor. Happy to be your drawing companion. On these long days of making art. Yeah, I'm not usually... I guess this is a pretty rare time for me to be on middle of the afternoon. I'm usually getting some exercise, walking my dog right now. But my dog isn't here. <laughs> She's with my in-laws for the next couple of days. Oh God. It's really such a bummer when she's not here. I'm so used to having her. I also don't get notifications e even though I'm supposed to. Yeah, I don't know what's up with the bell. I mean, you're supposed to, um, you gotta click the bell, but then you gotta click the bell again and you gotta set it to all notifications for the channel instead of personalized. So, uh, you know, who the hell is ever gonna do that? Frickin' nobody. And uh, there's no hope for us. How can I get as handsome as you? My premium bath water, dude. It's that simple. Send me an email. I'll use my Stripe account to generate you an invoice for $5,000. I'll send you a bottle of my bath water. You drink it up, drink it up. I'll show you how, I'll show you how to drink it. This is my water bottle, this is not my bath water. You know, I don't get high off my own supply, but you'll get a bottle, a little different than this. It'll be a plastic bottle, but you open it, you. Oh. Wow. Uh, okay. Okay. Anything to be as handsome as Steven. All right. All right, here we go. Oh. It's happening. My my face. It's transforming. Oh my god. I think it worked. It's well worth it. It's well worth it. It's really not all that expensive considering how efficacious it is. You're gonna be very happy with your purchase. I promise you that. So just drop me an email. As soon as I get your $5,000, bath water is in the mail. That simple, baby.
Hi, Steven. I'm watching your live and doing my new drawing project, a god with a hammer fighting a crazy humanoid lion. Good luck with that hammer humanoid crazy lion thing, man, Octavia, o Ottaviano, Ottaviano. Good luck with it. I'm sure it's awesome. Highway says, Steven, is it normal to find my finished paintings uninteresting in comparison to the awe I can feel from someone else's quick sketches? I never see my own work as special as I do theirs. It is normal. I mean, uh, it's a little bit unfortunate, but, um, I mean, it's sort of the curse of the artist that you'll, you'll never see your work the way other people see it, you know? Even after you've been on the path for a long, long time, um, occasionally you'll get one that you, that you're just like very surprised by and maybe you feel like you can kind of see it for what it is or, um, it's been many, many years since you've made a very good piece and it holds up and then you can kind of see it the way other people see it. But I think those are exceptions. I think for the most part, unfortunately, you're gonna spend most of your artistic career like that. I mean, me, you know, me personally, my best pieces based on, um, you know, I can still say like, yeah, those are my best, but the first thing I see when I look at them is what I could have done better. You know? That doesn't mean that I'm bummed by them, but I know I'm not seeing them the way uh, just like a fan is seeing them or an audience member is seeing them. I know that. Slothy says, do you have advice for a beginner painter? Any painting exercises or something equivalent? Um, I think, unfortunately, my answer there is pretty boring. I mean, um, if, you're, if you're just looking for, like, technicals, I think for most people, the most bang for your buck is just um, make sure you can paint the sphere very, uh, very efficiently and quickly. I know it's not an exciting thing to say, but the sphere is surprisingly... Uh, surprisingly nuanced and it's uh it's very unlikely that you'll be able to reliably control other subject matters if you can't control a sphere i think for any beginner of painting Assuming, when I say painting, and what I assume you mean painting is like full value painting. Like you're going to use, um, you're gonna use the modeling factors, you're gonna use, you're gonna try to create the illusion of form, you're gonna try to capture light, things like that. Um, there's other kinds of painting that don't focus on that. So uh, excuse me if that's the kind of painting you're looking at doing, but if you're doing that kind of painting that is really reliant on light and an illusion of light, the sphere is the place to start. You gotta give a real earnest look at the sphere and make sure you get it. Trevor Olson gave me $5, yeah! 
Really enjoyed your AI video. I've gone back to it a number of times. I love your point of why are we replacing this job that humans enjoy doing? It's like, I, I, I still don't know. I don't know. Doesn't seem like the best idea to me. I'm glad you enjoyed the video, Trevor, and thank you so much for the donation. I really appreciate it. I'm glad the AI video has uh, done a little bit of work out there in the world. Spread some info. Put it on people's radar. And thanks for giving it multiple views. Up in that view count, making that view count chubby. Thank you so much, Trevor Olson, for the chubby view count. A load of punk lay. Your OC is from the D&D &D world? Well, I think that's like a chicken and the egg situation. I wasn't thinking of Dungeons and Dragons when I started these sketches. I just wanted to draw some goblinish characters, but um, Dungeons and Dragons has been so influential on the entirety of that space that, like I said, it's a goblin or egg situation. It's a goblin or egg situation. It's a chicken or the egg situation. It's like, even if I wasn't thinking about Dungeons and Dragons, um, you're kind of operating within that milieu no matter what. I'm actually not that huge a Dungeons and Dragons fan. I mean, I've played it a few times, but um, it's never really stuck with me. I don't really know much about it. Not too up on the worlds or anything like that. Reminds me of Bebop from Ninja Turtles. Yeah, someone else said that on a previous stream. That's funny. I see where you're coming from with that. It's funny. We can't leave this nipple so cursorily indicated. Computer, enhance. Ah, yes. Much better. This is the appropriate scale for depicting a goblin nipple. Forever onward to new heights. On the Stephen Zapata art stream, we don't just accept 
enough as good enough on the back of our incredible insight and our belief on the world transforming power of art we insist on only the most profound most highfalutin most hipster interpretations of art and the goals that are appropriate for it excellent All of that work really paid off. It looks great when you zoom out. It looks absolutely amazing when you zoom out. Oh my God. It looks so good. <laughs> All right, my sweet stream people. I'm gonna start wrapping up here. As some of you know, I have a general four hour cutoff on drawing sessions to prevent burnout in the long run. And I have blown past that by about 50 minutes here. So I am going to start wrapping up Maybe I'll go take a walk, take a bit of a break. Then I've got feedback to do. But if anyone's got any last questions or anything like that, throw them in the chat. No problem. My pleasure. Happy to stream. Happy to stream. You've been on for that long today? Yeah, take a break. Oh, yeah. I need it. Especially since I got to go do notes and other things. Can't be, can't expend all of my energy here today. Yeah, I got to try to get some exercise. Got a bit of shopping to do. I got to go to the store. I'm trying to remember my to-do list here. <laughs> got to go to the store. Got a couple emails that I need to write. And notes. Got to give notes for the course. Got to give feedback for the course. For the course, of course. All right, but we did good stuff today. We did that guy on the right all the way from the beginning today. On here, we had a good old time. We're working on our gabos. Our gabos are truly coming along. What a lovely life to draw goblins. What a lovely life to draw goblins live on the internet. Incredible. Thank you for the advice, Stephen. Hey, no problem. Always happy to be here. Yeah, the nipple was really a crowning achievement. Yes, it was. If I do say so myself, it was a crowning achievement. Hold on, let me fix my gain here so I'm not destroying you guys as I talk right into my microphone. What working size is this? This is pretty big right now, not gonna lie. This is pretty large. 
this is it's 27,000 pixels across right now. 27,712 glorious pixels. That's a lot of pixels. Thanks for the stream. Always nice to listen while you work. No problem, man. My pleasure. Give kisses to Fanny when you see her. I will. So many kisses. You guys know you need to kiss your dog on the lips, right? You guys know that? If you don't kiss your dog on the lips, they get depressed. It's very important to kiss your dog on the lips. Very, very important. Daryl Grant says, quick question. About to work with a dip pen and ink for the first time soon. Have you ever tried one? Any quick tips or things to look out for? Um, I have used them a bunch in the past. It's been a long time. I actually, it's funny that you say that. I have some new ones coming in the mail today because uh, I uh, either lost my nibs or threw them out since the last time I used them. I couldn't find any. So um, it's funny that you say that right when I have some new ones coming. The keep a scrap sheet of paper around. I think that's the lowest, lowest hanging fruit. A lot of it is just experience and dexterity with the particular kinds of nibs you use. But um, you always want to have a scrap sheet around of the same kind of paper that you're doing your drawing on. So let's say you're drawing on bristle paper, have a, a throwaway sheet of the same bristle paper, maybe that you ripped off of one from the back of the pad or something. Have that right next to you so that you can um, test that you have the right amount of ink on the pen nib before you do important strokes in case you're doing, you know, high stakes drawing. And also, um, depending on the kind of paper you use, the nib will often catch little pieces of the grain, like little bits of the paper will get stuck in the nib. You can just press it onto the uh, scrap sheet with a little bit of strength, and then that will release the piece of paper and give you a clean line again. That's always worked for me. Nipple was the crowning achievement. Yep. Nipples on the goobies. You got to get the goobies on there. Thank you, Zapata. No problem, bats bug. Hey, Steven, is a niche or style more important for illustration work? In my opinion, yes. Yeah. For a designer, you can really be um, kind of a chameleon. It's useful if you can switch your style a lot. But for an illustrator, you're usually getting hired for your specific look. So I think style is much more important there. I, um, I've always been a little, I like trying too many things. Being an illustrator hardline as a profession was never going to be for me. Um, I like switching things up too much. It's, it, would be cra it would be very difficult for me to commit to one look for the amount of time necessary to have a hard illustration career with that look. It's always the same, right? I have to say, okay, I'm stopping about three to five times before I actually get myself to stop. Yeah, it's hard. It's very difficult. I really like drawing. It's always hard. Steven, what do you think uh, what do you think is poorly correlated with motion tagging system? Poorly correlated with motion tagging system enough to keep AI away from taking over the videos, at least for some time. Um, the people who I've spoken to, the machine learning people, um, whenever they've discussed data poisoning or any kind of technique to try to prevent the AIs, from getting good data if they're going to trawl publicly, um, the answers that I get are complicated, complicated. Uh, I'm not the person to ask about that because they are shockingly technical questions. They require a lot of knowledge. Um, but, you know, just right off the bat saying I'm not an expert, based on the conversations I've had, um, it's unlikely anything simple would be enough. I may be wrong, but from what I've learned, uh, I don't think anything simple like that would do. It would need to be more complicated. All right, everybody. I'm going to run. Thank you so much for being here. This was a very fun five hours of drawing. Do not forget that Form from Imaginacion is on sale for the next week until November 28th. It is $100 off. Go to www.formfromimagination.com to check out the course if you want to see the curriculum or if you want to pick it up. For everybody who is getting it, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing your assignments. 
Uh, good luck with all of your creative endeavors today out there in the world, no matter what it is that you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're drawing or sculpting or writing or dancing or arguing with your mother about something she's completely wrong about, or maybe you're making music, or maybe you're shaving a picture of someone into the back of someone's head, or you're making jewelry, or you're climbing a mountain and convincing yourself that it's an art form because you're just in a very open state of mind, or you're a dentist who's zoning out while you're giving someone a root canal, and even though they're squirming underneath the tool that is torturing their most secret places, you're just zoned out and thinking, you know what? This is an art form. Whatever situation you might be in, if you're having that thought, if you're feeling that feeling, that it might just be an art form, whatever it is that you're doing, uh, I want it to go great. I want you to have a great time doing that. I want you to extract as much joy and positivity from that experience as is possible. That's my wish for you. That's what I want for all sentient beings on the earth today, um, including animals, definitely including animals, dogs, cats, everybody. I mean, dogs are creative. They can be creative. They can make art. That's why I don't, personally speaking, personally speaking, that's why I refuse to put my dog on antidepressants. It makes her less creative. Her depression contributes to her creative edge and just, you know, I'd rather she be sharp and be able to make her art rather than being kind of numb. That's a joke for the record. It, does, it doesn't help making art to be depressed all the time. I'm fucking around. All right, everybody.